Hello and welcome to a special presentation from In The Money Media. We're doing the show in conjunction with our partners at Racelens. On today's uh, Racelens Deep Dive, we're going to be looking at some class angles. Before we get to that, before we introduce our guest, I want to remind folks, we still have this special deal going on. It is for a limited time only, but it's definitely worth taking a look at. You can save $300 on an annual subscription and get a free year of In The Money Plus. And what a time to do In The Money Plus. We're coming up to uh, all the extra Keeneland coverage that we're doing, basically trying to go weekly on In The Money Plus now. I know it was a little bit of a lean winter, but uh, things are about to heat up because we've got the whole Derby package coming, which is, you know, many have said is worth the annual value of the thing uh, by itself. So you'll get that. you get $300 off Racelens, the place to go to check it all out in the money podcast.com slash race lens we'll remind you more about that one more time later in the show right now let's bring in today's special guest a key member of the in the money media team and also a race lens power user he's matt fact volgi matt how are things things are good things are good uh snowy uh, another snowy day here in saratoga but uh no things are th things are good here and yeah hopefully the you know the racing continues to get better and better as we head towards uh triple crown season the little house on the east side is actually in use this weekend. Good friends are, are up there. Um, so I had about some people and some neighbors reach out. Hey, let's hang out. Nope, not me. Um, so one of my uh, one of my oldest friends uh, from, from high school up there using it as a basis for some skiing. I'm down here in not so sunny Florida today. But uh, really, we're not here to talk about the specifics of today so much as what race lens can do for us uh, writ large. We were talking before about um, off air about this cool new way you can use race lens to analyze these derby future pools. Maybe we'll do, we'll do a future show about that. But let folks know what's going on as far as that goes, where they can where they can find it if they want to check that out. Yeah, so on the uh, on the landing page, so when you go to your home page on the left hand side, as we've shown before, it has a rundown of all the tracks. Um, what Racelands does is, if there's any kind of like special bet, so the, you know, pick five, if there's the um, uh, you know what, whatever, any kind of special bet, they'll separate those out. Like the Golden Hour wagers, they'll have that those Coast separated. To coast, cross country, that kind of stuff. You got it, absolutely. So any of those will be separated out. And then what we have this year on there is the Kentucky Derby future pools. So the the it's a huge list of of horses on there. But anybody that's listed in that pool, whatever the odds are on there, they'll show that on there. But what it does is it ties in the uh, past performances, any kind of angles that would show up under those horses. So I think it's a great way to look to see uh, you know what the market looks like, and then start to gather some initial thoughts. So. I thought that was interesting there. You get a good good view of the uh, Kentucky Derby pool uh, well in advance and start to take a peek uh, from a uh, statistical standpoint uh, on race lines. Note to self, maybe we'll take a look at that um, next time around. We've got coverage of the future pool, coverage uh, for free of racing daily over at InTheMoneyPodcast.com. Folks may want to check that out as well. But we're here today to talk specifically about class angles from Racelands. This is one we've talked about before uh, that we did when we, we, uh, we did one of our earlier shows. But when you hear people say, what's the biggest drop in racing? They'll usually say maiden special weight to maiden claimer. Here is the actual number using Racelands for the last year as of this broadcast, what it looks like um, nearly 8,000 starts, 15% win with a minus 25% ROI. When you see a stat like this, Matt, what does it tell you? I mean, it doesn't, does it tell me a whole lot? Not necessarily, but you know, it, it does tell me based on that sample size. I mean, that's a, it's a fairly decent clip on a percentage wise. The 25% ROI is not outrageous, meaning these horses aren't completely getting killed uh, in, in the wind pools either. So to me, it, it tells me there's, there's something there to that general idea, right? And that's kind of the whole point of this is, <laughs> going back to how I got started using race lens is, is proving or disproving all the things I've heard at the racetrack, right? When I first started playing, you have to do this. You've got to bet this. Well, I don't know. Maybe let's look at the numbers and let's see what they say, right? Cause math doesn't lie. So I'll trust math. And so these are one of the things that I would hear like, Oh, if you see a horse like this, you got to look at it. I mean, that's the biggest drop in racing. You got to, you got to take a look at this horse. So it's not disproving it. It's also not necessarily saying you got to bet every one of these horses either. 
to me, it, it helps me look maybe I look at this broadly and say, eh, but then I'll look a little bit deeper to see maybe I can find some connections in there that may do this better than others. Uh, that's kind of how I how I look at this, Pete. That's smart. And then there's also looking at other handicapping factors and how they play with this, this stat. That's something we'll look at. And if you are a race lens user, you can, you know, you can start looking at things the other way too. I don't, we don't have this stat pulled, but for example, if you know, you really want to look at the class difference, maybe you want to look at what happens to maiden claimers when they go up the ladder into maiden special weights. Really, it is a bottomless research tool in terms of all the things you can look at. Let's move on to our next slide, Matt, and, and uh, discuss that one. Yeah, and it's uh, it's it's funny you you mentioned um, the class up. Maybe next time if I can remember, I'll show a Jonathan Wong stats of a class up. It's it's pretty interesting when you when you look at it there. But again, you can start to look at different trainers, different connections, and how how that works off the claim going up, going down. Um, that's where it starts to get uh, starts to get interesting. So this is kind of the progression, right? This is like an idea of looking at this a little bit further of saying. Okay, let's take a, a little bit of a deeper dive. Not only that large, that big class drop from maiden special weight to maiden claiming, but what about speed figures, right? Well, if you look at equibase speed figures and we're looking at the projected top, either you know, top pace or top, top speed, does that make a difference? And you start to see these numbers change, right? I mean, it seems logical, but at least seeing that here, right, it, it starts to whittle that down a bit more. Where you can get a little bit more concentrated, and you can see this here on on the best Equibase speed figure last out. So what it does is, out of the entire race, who has the best speed figure from the last race, dropping in from main special weight to main and claimer over the last year of those 508 starts, 32% win clip and, and a minus six percent ROI. So to me, that's that huge. tells me a lot there. Yeah, that's a really big one because they're winning. Okay, best speed figure last out. That's probably nearly. A proxy for the favorite, right? Those are the best speed figure last out. These horses are getting bet, but instead of losing whatever it would be, I'm making up numbers here. But if you bet every favorite, what are you losing? Thirty cents on the dollar, 20, at least twenty cents on the dollar. I guess thirty cents on the dollar. Here you're weeding a lot of that out. I'm guessing this maiden special weight to maiden claimer best equibase speed figure last out. This these are horses you can build something around. I mean, if you can just yeah. use your traditional handicapping to overcome that you know, minus 6%, most good handicappers, I'm going to go ahead and say, are going to be able to do that. And these are horses you you can key around. Yeah. And this is also one too, where I think, you know, the, the average player may miss this, right? And what I've noticed, you just have some dirty run lines, right? Of just horses that are running just way above their head. The visual looks terrible, but they're actually running pretty well against that competition and their speed figure relative to this group is significantly better, but the visual just doesn't look good. You just, you, they sometimes gravitate towards those horses that continue to knock at this level constantly, right? They're finishing second, finishing third. And, and again, the money just continues to gravitate there where a horse like this may be coming in off that class drop, maybe not looking visually impressive, but on a speed figure perspective does look good. I think that's where you start to find some value in, in, in a stat like this. That's an interesting point. I didn't even think about that. I was thinking that these were all going to be favorites, but maybe there's some sort of buried best speed figure last out type horses. It that matters too. You know, if we had more time, we and with the power of race lens, you could we could dig in. We could look at every runner in that sample and see what price they are um and and come to some further conclusions. This is a great tool to research on your own. We just are showing this high level stuff. But the point isn't to stop here. The point is to go on and do your own work. Now, when I understood this stat from my early time in the game, made in special way to made in claimer, I always liked it a lot more if the horse had speed. And interestingly, though, when we look at that over the last year projected on lead first call, it's a big sample, 700 starts, uh, a solid win percentage, 25%. Again, not a hideous ROI, not you know, the minus 30 or 40 you'll see on a lot of stats, but at minus 21, I'd say this is a, with, on the ROI side. This is not a stat you could use in, in isolation. What do you make of, and we have a lot of stats in the show, actually, that have very similar numbers to this, where there's clearly signal in it. It clearly means horses are going to win, but it's also not really getting you too much ahead of the market. What use do you find for a stat like the second one on the current slide? Yeah, I would say I, the 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 first one is a little bit more is is useful. That that's one that draws my attention and, and dig a little bit deeper. The second one to me is more 
again, basic idea about how I came up with this a long time ago was in, in these types of races, these horses are there for a reason. They don't like to pass horses, right? So it's like looking at it, not just from an average speed figure, but looking at it from a pace perspective, can I look at it that way and say, okay, like how many of these horses get to the lead and just keep going, right? And it just, if they're projected on the, on the lead of the first call, how much of that is it actually a big factor? Again, it, it, it does, it, it's not a, a dead angle, but it's not something that's overwhelming. Right. So it's not something that I would just blindly lead on. If, if like, especially in, if we're looking at on a, in a turf race, you know, I think it's, it's easy to look at, say, okay, in these races, let's just, whoever's getting on the front end, you know, let's, let's do kind of pile some money on there. It's not telling me that this is an angle that I gravitate towards almost blindly. I mean, you shouldn't really gravitate to any of these angles blindly, but I would say that's kind of how I look at this one. But just to give you the idea of how I came up with this and how you can start to research yourself when you have these ideas, like, if we do, if we're projecting this horse to get onto the lead, how how likely are these horses to finish um, in, in these types of races? So again, not not terrible, but it's not something that really jumps off the page. And further exploration here that you could do, you could look at this sprints versus routes and turf versus dirt, and I think you might, you know, you might find some some signal in that. Right in a, in a turf route, I wouldn't really expect this that you know just from with my traditional you know, sort of crude knowledge, narratives of, of, you know, handicapping brain, I wouldn't expect that to be nearly as powerful as in a dirt sprint. But the truth is in the numbers, sometimes it ends up being exactly the opposite because all the conventional wisdom goes that way. And meanwhile, then all of a sudden speed and turf routes becomes underrated. That's the kind of thing you can look at with race lens. Let's move on. We've got some other class angles we want to talk about. Um, and this is one that actually comes in a roundabout way from the Brad Free book, Handicapping 101, where I remember him saying the biggest, yes, maiden special to maiden dropper is a big class drop, but it's often, you know, uh, it's often accounted for by the market. I remember him saying, and, you know, he wrote this, to be fair, he wrote the book over 20 years ago, but the, at that time, especially horse looking at the class drop involved when horses come out of grade one races. And we privately ran uh, this to from going from a grade one to, to a grade uh, to a grade three. And the numbers were very similar to what we see right there with grade one to allowance 182 starts in the past year, 27% win. So some signal there for sure, but that minus 25% ROI makes it clear that this also isn't one. I, I don't imagine we're going to be building a lot of other other angles around I mean, you might still be able to but it's certainly nothing that you could do automatically when it comes to horses coming out of grade ones it's very obvious that these are courses are typically going to be the class of the race and the crowd is on to them yeah and again I, I think this is one of those kind of basic ideas you can build a progression and you know we'll we'll end with one of those progressions that i think is really really interesting but this is a way to look at it from a broad spectrum of like, do these horses just overwhelmingly dominate when they make this move from a grade one going into an allowance? And we'll we'll show it on a claiming uh, standpoint as well. But yeah, I think a high one clip, 27% out of that sample is not bad. 25%, negative 25% tells me that this is a pretty obvious um, kind of take from, from the average uh, horse player. So the public is certainly on board here. But what I do like in race lens as well is you can see progressions from time frames. You can go back as far as five years and then you can progress out to say, all right, well, let's look at four years, three years, two years. And you can look at, you know, one year, six months, the last month, the last two weeks, right? So you can see like, is there a change in tide, so to speak, with a particular angle? I like to use that when I have an angle that's really been working well. Um, and then I start to see either the pricing of it change a bit, or I start to see it just kind of adjust a bit. Then I want to take a look more broadly to see like, is there a, a bit of a change? And you can see that, right? You can see that right in front of you just by literally clicking a few times what that pricing and what that win percentage looks like. But as you can see, I mean, yeah, 12 starts is not huge, but you know, again, it's, it's something that's not dead, right? So I think it's right. something to take a look at. And I also think it's something to dig a little bit deeper when it comes to connections with, to making that move um, from grade ones in, into allowance company. But Again, just to highlight, you can look at different time frames and you can look at it from, from different perspectives. My gut with this last month one is, hey, it's just a little bit of randomness, five, five of 12 in this sample. These are horses that win a lot. They win 27% of the time, just like, you know, the coin that flips 
heads seven out of ten that the point isn't biased it's just the way that one went for that small sample i'm guessing that's what's at play here in this specific one but then there's maybe other times especially if you're dealing with a place like california where the weather can be very consistent you know may, maybe it's some um, maybe you'll you'll see something different in the last month due to bias or due to a hot barn or something that changes due to the crowd catching up. It's just a smart way of being able to parse the data and look at the world. It's not necessarily handing it to you on a silver platter. You've got to think critically about it still, but I think it's an extremely useful tool when you're you know, databasing like this. Where shall we head next? Yeah, so we'll take a look at it from just general, like look at it from a broad view of stakes races as a whole, right? So look at any any stakes race going into claiming races, right? So I think that's something that's more, I would say, logical, right? If you look at the field, you're right, looking at a, a you know a, a claiming race, and you got a horse that's coming out of a grade three, grade two, even a you know some very small sample of grade one, as you can see down there. But to take a look to see, I mean, it, it looks like this is more of kind of a, I don't want to call it a desperation move, but it, it, uh, it's something that doesn't really jump off the page at all. This is, I would say this is flashing a little bit more of a red signal when you see a horse coming out of a stakes race and, and showing up in a, in a claiming race, uh, not necessarily pointing to, uh, you know, uh, needing a race or anything like that. And that's kind of a comment on the prior prior angle too. You'll notice that it doesn't take into account layoffs. So you'll see someone like Chad Brown that has horses that were in a grade one that had a long layoff coming back into an allowance race that needs a race, right? So you start to you start to see more patterns of trainers when they start to bring horses back into season, like whatever their season is, right? You start to see that progression a bit more. But if you look at this on a claiming standpoint, I mean, just 17% wins on that, a pretty decent sample of 776 oh, yeah, and a negative 32% ROI. So it's, it's yeah. certainly not, uh, not, 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 uh, not pointing in the right direction there for sure. But I, and that one's logical to me, right? Cause you have a horse who's out of conditions so you try them in a stake race, right? right? And then that presumably doesn't work out, right? Because if it worked out, they wouldn't be running in a claiming race very often the next race. But again, it's sort of like a horse that's out of conditions. You, you don't know what you don't know what to do with them. They're not fast enough to compete at the stakes level. It's somewhat logical to me from a narrative yep. point of view that that's, that, that's, that's much worse than I thought it would be. Don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying, oh, I knew that would be the case. But now that I see it, it, it makes intuitive sense to my brain why why that stat is as bad as it is. And, you know, I mean, I would take a – again, you could drill down uh, if you're doing your own work here in Racelands. But, I mean, these are going to be horses that are bad. I mean, these are – that to me is actually a significant angle to find horses to bet against. And that's that's something that you can also do. Um, that's something you can also do with, with, with race lens. Interestingly, and it's a tiny sample, 11 starts, but it is interesting that the grade one horses going into claiming, um, do still win their fair share, mo, mo, you know, the win like, but I mean, in truth, that's still probably a little bit of a negative, right? Cause grade one into a claiming your, I bet you all 11 of those are favorites and yet they're only winning at 27%. So I guess what I'm trying to say is this is to me, an example of how race lens can also point out horses you want to bet against on. Yeah, and you make a good point there, Pete. When you run the angle, you can, as we've shown before, you can look at the actual, all the races that that funnel into the angle. You can look at it on a line-by-line -line basis. You can click on a hyperlink and actually bring up the chart. So you can, you can see the full chart of the race all within one, one space here, which that's, what, that's how I start to think of like what I call, again, progression angles off of this. Um, but I wanted to show the grade one into all claims because I was just curious, right? And I think yep. that this is another one of those things where – you know, I'm just I, either I see it or, you know, I'm like, wow, this horse is showing up in this race. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if I wonder what happens with these horses. To me, that's that's kind of the what's drawn me to this for so long since race lens has started, why I've been been using it for that reason. Right. I've done it at home. I've literally like I've said before, I've been on the rail at Saratoga. They do have a great app, by the way, or a great uh, um uh, mobile uh, usage on, on, on race lens as well. I'd run angles right there. I'm just curious, right, to see like how often this happens. It doesn't happen often. They do win their fair share. But to me, when I look at both of these, they're bet against, right? I think that's kind of the general idea is that I do want to bet against these horses. You're right. The first, the top angle there with going into, into those claiming races from all stakes races, it makes sense. And kind of what you said, this is like a throw up your hands. This is like I, I envision the private meeting with with connections of like, I don't know what to do with this horse. Right. <laughs> Tried everything. We got a spot we can run him back in. Like, what do you think? All right, let's do it. Right. To me, that's like I know I'm simplifying it, but like that to me 
is the verbiage that kind of like comes out into this statistic there. So it makes sense to me. It is a little bit deeper than I thought, but, and then on, on the grade ones going into claiming, I just, I was curious to see how many do it. Not many do it, but they still win in a decent clip. Let's move on to our next slide and continue our conversation of class angles that you can find through race lens. Yeah. So this, this last one here, and just to kind of set this up, this is where you can get very granular, right? So we've kind of given you some, some general stuff. That's the idea of, of these shows I want to do with you is just to kind of get an idea of just some general things you can do, but also understand that you can drill down and go into it a bit deeper. So part of, on a class standpoint, looking at class drops, I like to use data to handicap intent, right? What is the intent of what they're doing? And does the data tell me a story of what they're doing, right? A lot of times if they're very good at something, the data will come back and show you that, right? You see that all over the world, stuff I do overseas, stuff I do domestically, you see that in patterns. And this stat I thought was really interesting. Something that I, <laughs> you know, you hear a lot and, you know, I think of it, and even, uh, you know, my guy, Seth Merrill on OTB TV, he mentions it all the time. His Clarevich horse is the Chad Clarevich. Uh, that, that's that's a kind of his his angle there. And I just got curious one day. I'm like, you know what? These big class droppers at Saratoga specifically on the dirt, which I've seen the most from Clarevich. Like when they have a – so the five-point-plus equibase class drop, that's a massive drop on an equibase scale, Right. What do these big class drops mean for for someone like a, a large operation like Clarevich? What, like – are they just doing this for a reason? Is it just to get wins? And I think it just, it. I know this is a small sample, seven starts, but what it tells me in those seven starts, there is heavy intent of what they're looking to do. They are looking to get a win at Saratoga and they're spotting these horses in a position to do that, right? 50%, 57% of those were winners. A hundred percent of those hit the board. And you still have a positive ROI of 34%. Because what it tells me, Pete, is I think I think that the public may look at it's like, okay, there's something fishy here. Something's going on. Right. Why is this horse in smell a rat? You see, you yeah. see a horse that can be competitive in an allowance race running in a claiming race. I mean, in the old days, you remember in Bro Brohammer in the classic book. Modern pace handicapping is basically a, one of the one of the non pace chapters in the book is all about negative class drops telling you to bet against horses in theory like this. The game has changed so much since modern pace was was published that it's no longer really um, um, relevant. Just the way the game has changed again, the big purses relative to the value of horses, etc., have changed this. But still, I think horse players have a, a knee jerk reaction, like, "Well, why in the heck would you run in a claimer if you could clearly be competitive in allowance?" Well, maybe one of the reasons is you want to win the owner title at Saratoga. That is what this tells me. Not only is this not a negative drop with these crazy numbers. It's positive and any kind of angle you can build around. And it's not just the seven starts of 23. This goes back for the last five years. Yeah. On a five year, it's 21 starts again. It's over five years is small, but I view that as a positive. Again, you can look at small samples and large samples differently, right? To me, I look at this small sample as a positive, meaning they don't do this often. This isn't just a tonnage, throw everything against the wall and see what sticks. This is a very, I, I feel that they're very constructive in what they do and, and, and how they drop these horses and the numbers play out that way, right? 43% winners over that time frame and still a solid positive 29% ROI. So the point, what's the point of all this? When you run into a horse and you're like, huh, why is this horse here? And then you see that you look a little bit deeper and you see the connections. You see Clarivis show up in one of some of these races what I'm saying is rethink it, right? There, there's a reason they really feel this horse has a overwhelming chance to win. The numbers prove it. So this is where it can really help you kind of dig a little bit deeper where some may go the other way to say, there's no way I'm playing that horse. Something's up. You can look at it a bit differently. And I think it can help you here. Question for you that you may not know the answer to. So in Saratoga, you know, modern racing, especially we see so many situations where, it's an ownership group, you know, Mike Rapoli, another one who will be trying to win the, that uh, title at Saratoga. He'll have different partners for different horses. Is there a way to look at all the Rapoli horses or do you have to look sort of partnership by partnership? And does it get very tricky in that situation? It, it could get a little tricky, but um, like if you do, it, Rapoli will, will will bring in everything, right? So that, that name will attach all. And, okay. and, and that, that'll attach all. And then same thing with Clarevich will attach all. 
sometimes it does get a, a little bit tricky where like like our good friends at 10 strike if, if there's like a partner with 10 strike sometimes that gets sometimes that won't be included so it does get a little tricky i will say that it's it's not it's not perfect but if you work through it a bit you, you'll be able to you can identify any any owner that shows up in in the group um if, if you can search through and add as many as you want in there and, and that's and great it'll, it'll run through this it'll run through the the data and, and and show it to you so that gives you more flexibility than some of the data database and competition out there we're out of time matt but want to remind folks if you want to get involved with race lens you can save 300 dollars right now on an annual subscription and get a free year of in the money plus at a great time to do so so we're talking about basically a 500 dollars savings in the money podcast.com slash race lens. We're going to be back. I don't know next if we're going to do a, uh, a the future. No, let's not, let's not wait till the next future pool. Let's come back and uh, I'll just production meeting in the middle of the show, maybe some speed figure based angles for a show. We'll try to get on here sooner rather than later. I really enjoy these conversations, Matt. And I thank you for your time. Always good to be here, Pete. Uh, enjoy the, uh, you know, I know you're toughing it out there in Florida, but uh, enjoy the enjoy the weather down there. But uh, it's a it's a great track. I've been there before. It's a great track, old school. It's uh, but it's a it's a cool place. And uh, tell uh, tell Jason Beam I said hello. I definitely will. I'm going to go bother him. I always w worry about bothering an announcer on a muddy day. I figure it's more stressful for them when it's harder to see the colors. But I've been <laughs> loving Tampa Bay Downs, and I will do just that for Matt Vag Volgi. I'm Peter Thomas for Natal. May you win all your photos. <laughs>